Welcome, everyone. It is uh, now 1230 p.m. Eastern um, Eastern time. So I just wanted to welcome everyone um, to this webinar. Uh, mm -hmm. First, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending today. We're all going through a lot. It's um, It's been a, a crazy year, right, uh, to say the least. And I first, I want to acknowledge um, that we're having this webinar at a, at a time in the U.S. where we're at a crossroads, right? Like we've been dealing with the twin pandemic of both racism and COVID. And it's taken a toll on our programs, our young people, and as well um, as ourselves, right? So first I wanted to acknowledge that of, of everything that's going on. And then thank you all for doing the work on the ground level. Um, as I travel, um, well, I'm not traveling right now, but as I meet communities virtually, it always amazes me all the great work that is being being done, all the innovation that has um, been, going, been going on. <clears throat> and as we look forward to a new year and a new administration, we can't take the same approaches um, in solving youth homelessness as we did in the past, right? Like we need to start doing things differently. Um, and there are innovative solutions um, everywhere um, uh, and globally, um, locally, um, and, and those, um, and we need to start looking at those uh, innovative solutions and seeing how we can adapt them to our context, right? So this webinar series, it is designed for that. It's actually designed to open those discussions, learn from each other, and specifically learning from our, our neighbors up north, um, our Canadian partners at um, Away Home Canada. Um, we're excited to work with our colleagues um, in Canada to bring you this webinar series. Last year, um, um, many of you um, were part of our summit um, where we introduced human-centered design. Uh, we worked with our colleagues at Away Home, uh, Away Home Canada on how to center young people in developing solutions. Um, and today, we're here to continue that shared learning and that, like, uh, and that connection that we have uh, with our colleagues. Um, and as we're going through this webinar series, right? Like, what can we learn? What can we apply? What's translatable? All of those questions are are important into um, it, it, uh, to the work that we do, and especially moving forward uh, in this year. Uh, next slide. So, just a quick reminder um, that. Uh, we are having a virtual summit. Um, also, this this webinar series will um, also have a session um, at the at the virtual summit. So um, a lot of the learnings will continue on um, all the way until March. So if you have not registered for our summit, it's March 24th and 25th, and you can visit our website. Um, in order to to register for that. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our amazing colleagues from Canada um, so they can start their uh, their presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to, first of all, let you know who we all are. Um, uh, we have four of us from Away Home Canada today, and uh, our, our names are Amanda Buknia, who's uh, the Policy and Planning Coordinator. Orpa Kundangan is the Art Community Animator. Heidi Walter is our Training and Program Implementation Manager, and I am Mary Jane McKitterick, the Community Planning Manager, and we will all be uh, playing different uh, roles in, the, in this webinar. Next slide, please. So today we would like to... Um, uh, do a, a land acknowledgement and just a bit of background in Canada as a result of the Truth and Reconciliation Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Commissions and land back movements, um, organizations and individuals, uh, non-Indigenous, are learning how to provide land acknowledgements as a way of engaging with our history in colonialism and white supremacy and our commitment to truth, justice and reconciliation moving forward. Um, Non-Indigenous people are still learning how to do this respectfully and, and it continues to evolve as we accept our responsibilities. So this is uh, where we are today with, with this process. Um, but also today, since this meeting is being held online, a singular land acknowledgement doesn't really capture the richness of our distribution across many locations across Turtle Island and around the world. There are a few places on earth where that someone before us is not called home. As a way home Canada is hosted in Toronto, we thought we would like to share the land acknowledgement that is used here, uh, even though several of us are, including myself, are in different parts of Canada currently right now, currently. And we invite all of you who are joining us today to consider their own position with regard to the land with which, on which you find yourself. Away Home Canada acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. 
It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit and, and Métis communities. And we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject uh, of the Dished with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, and, and it's an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you. So today we are very excited to be here from, from Canada, from Way Home Canada, and collaborating with, with the National Network for Youth. Um, as, as Andrew mentioned, we have three in a series, and today is session one. Uh, um, and we're talking about the shift to prevention in Canada. And, and this came about because last year we had such a fantastic time uh, at the summit and the roundtables and folks kept asking us questions about how we got where we are. Um, and we thought this would be a great time to, to really pro provide the context and the history. How do we get where we are and, and where are we going? The next uh, webinar that we'll be ha having, uh, we'll be unpacking more of the frontline prevention. That'll be in February. Um, and we'll be talking about some, some hard truths and some eye openers as we come to terms with that frontline piece in Canada. So we welcome you. We'll also do our best. Uh, this one today will be a little bit more content, us doing a lot of talking. Um, but the, the, the next two especially will be uh, more really trying to focus in on how it relates to the U.S. context and getting your stories. Um, and then in March, we are going to be doing the, talking about the cross systems and youth homelessness prevention and examples from Canada and the US. So we look forward to, to seeing you all again. Next slide, please. Thanks. Oops. Um, so who are, what is a way home? Who are we? We're a national coalition. Uh, we're reimagining solutions to youth homelessness. Um, but most, most of our work does happen right here in Canada, but we have partnerships global, globally, including a, a, an away home chapter in the United States, across Europe, and in Australia. We're really united in our mission to prevent and end youth homelessness. And I invite you to please visit our website at awayhome.ca to learn more about our work, details about our team, uh, and our national partners as well. So what do we do? We focus on, um, we believe that change occurs at the intersection of policy, planning, and practice. Um, this ensures that solutions to youth homelessness ref not only reflect the, the realities of community, but are also connected to those broader systems that are required to have lasting impact on youth homelessness. Today's presentation. Pretty simple today. We'll, we're going to be talking for about an hour. We're going to be going through four different stages uh, of our, our development. Um, but we will, we do have time, 20 to 25 minutes for questions and comments, and you can start putting them in the chat uh, right now if you want. Um, and um, and um, uh, National Alliance, uh, uh, National Network staff, or, or team are going to be uh, monitoring those questions, but we'll be answering them at the end of the, of the webinar. Okay, so um, we're going to start with, we do have a timeline to, to share with you, but we thought it would be easier if we, uh, rather than sort of throwing out a lot of things, this happened, that happened, really focusing in on four areas of change and growth and watch how they evolved over the, the timeline since pre-2015 until now. So the first one that we're going to be focusing on, and you'll see how that evolves, is youth voice and equity. Um, and that really means uh, we're going to be looking at how we are placing those lived experience uh, at the center of programs and services. And uh, rather than the forcing them to fit into a one-size-fits-all program, so the the youth voice and the equity piece is is really critical to how how we have developed. <clears throat> the second one, though, is trust and relationships. Um, that is something that I think is like a glue that is often hidden. We don't talk about it, but it really does hold all of the work together. And th this is about how we evolved our relationships and the trust across multiple systems sectors. Um, and individuals. So it could be between service providers and people with lived experience, the sector and public systems, between funders, those relationships within organizations, across teams with landlords, etc. Any kind of relationship that's necessary to, to solve a complex social issue such as homelessness and youth homelessness. The next one we'll be, we'll be talking about um, is research to practice. And that has been a critical piece of our, I think of where we have successes, that's where that fits in. So how are we bringing a, an evidence base to our youth homelessness practice? And how did that enable us to shift from that crisis response, which I'll get into in a bit, to prevention? 
The fourth area of change and growth is policy and systems. And this, I think, is pretty obvious to you folks. How we're able to shift the homelessness system, which we have had great success with, and how we're starting to shift corresponding public systems over time to address challenges in youth homelessness. OK, so this is our timeline. Uh, we began in around 20. 2012 actually, so we'll be talking, our first phase of our, our, our presentation will be pre-2015. Um, and then we'll have a section on, from 2015 to 2017. So, and that was where we, uh, our coalition began. So prior to 2015, it was coalition building. 2018 to 2019 was where the research to practice really kicks in um, and the public systems. And then now, and then we'll talk about 20, 2020 to 2021, which is, has a lot of um, surprises with COVID, et cetera. So the first, as I said, the first phase, I'm going to start us off with phase one because I actually was around then. So I kind of will talk about that. Uh, the coalition building portion that and that building to try to give youth homelessness a platform which it didn't have before. So our first uh, our first point or question is why would you prioritize youth homelessness? Because youth homelessness touches every community and age group. Um, why is it special? Why would we focus all our, of our efforts at, uh, on youth and young people specifically? Next slide. So we, we hope that you will never unsee this. <laughs> That's a design of that. We have been treating young people like mini adults for a really long time. And I'm just going to shout out to Amanda for uh, thinking about how we've looked at all those old medieval Renaissance and Victorian photos and, and, and portraits of children and babies who are, are look like old men. So it's a beautiful way of kind of visualizing what we've been doing with young people over time. Um, it's pretty hilarious, especially the little guy on the left there. But the real, beyond being funny, this has caused real harm um, by, by allowing the needs of young people to be downplayed or ignored in our approaches to youth homelessness. So that's really the impetus for, for the work that we're doing. That's great. <clears throat> So what we'll do then in each phase is we'll talk about the challenges uh, through the, the four areas of change and kind of break down those key challenges. So I'll just go over a little bit of that with you right now. Youth voice and equity. We, so as we've said, youth were lumped in with adults and the adult models. And this was presented a, a, a lot of barriers to support with uh, within the sector policies and also practice. But you know, with youth voice, we didn't really ask anyone who was homeless um, back in the day prior to 2015, let alone youth experiencing homelessness, what they really needed. We assumed that we knew best, um, and, and um, that has come across, uh, across all homelessness, but really asking young people what they needed to, before they were homeless and what could have made a difference was, was not on our radar at that time. Also, issues of equity and rights between different populations weren't really considered or baked into. So we didn't really talk about, you know, issues for how, how homelessness and, and solutions would work for Indigenous youth, LGBTQ2S, um, uh, Black youth, newcomer youth, disabled youth. We didn't ask those questions, and, and that was a, a huge challenge, so we didn't understand a lot. In terms of trust and relationships, there was a lack of trust across many of those relationships that impacted young people. Um, we also lacked a unified voice or a platform for you. So there was really nobody speaking for the sector, but also for young people as well. And there was no place for them to actually speak for themselves either. Um, and there was really not an understanding of how to collaborate in a meaningful way. The, the youth sector was, was very much out of the homelessness sector. And, and if you're saying, yeah, yeah, we, I, I also know that this is the, many of this is the, it, the case in the U.S. It's, it's not that different. And I also know that you've done a ton of work in this area. So, so acknowledging that, that are many of, we have many shared um, conditions across, across our, our countries and Turtle Island. So thank you for that. Um, so research to practice. Um, interestingly, the, there wasn't, um, any evidence or very little evidence, I should say, to support really the solid interventions for young people. We lacked, um, and there lacked a meaningful connection between researchers and the sector. So researchers were in the universities or in, in other research um, institutions and the sector was out there doing the frontline work. So it was a real recognition at that point too that we needed to bring those together. We also lacked a language to talk about the issues. So even about prevention, et cetera. Oops. Um, and then with the policy and, and systems, you, you might imagine prevention itself was not seen as a possibility 
Um, I w was in many rooms where folks said, you're preventing homelessness just isn't possible. And it comes from, I think, an older sort of charitable view of, you know, the homeless, the poor, they'll always be with us. So that sort of permeated the thinking at the time. Um, and youth were a hot potato between systems. So they were, you know, education, uh, child welfare, justice social services, they were all sort of saying, well, it's your, your, your problem, your problem. Uh, it was really hard to pinpoint where, and, and often, and especially with under 16s, they were cared for by the child protection, so everyone sort of defaulted to, to child protection. Uh, I'm thinking that's good, yes. Okay, so what, uh, we, came, what, what we started to, to get out of that before 2015 was that preventing young people from experiencing homelessness reduces the likelihood that they will experience chronic homelessness as adults. So there was actually some, some evidence, some research at that time, uh, that, that uh, chronically homeless adults, many of them, a significant portion, had been, um, had been uh, homeless as, as young people. So part of the answer around prevention, where I think I look at it as prevention in two ways. It means starting with young people early in their life. So to, to prevent young people from um, leaving home, uh, being in shelters, uh, entering the street life, etc. You have to work upstream to get uh, with prevention interventions in schools, in homes, with families, etc. But it's also like for the broader homelessness sector, at, uh, addressing youth homelessness means that you're stopping that pipeline into chronic addict, ad, adult homelessness as well. So that connection between youth ho homelessness, ending youth homelessness prevents chronic adult homelessness. Another big realization we, we got to around that period. I'll just take a sip. <laughs> so this next slide is a really powerful one um, that um, really when this at this time this image really helped to crystallize what everyone was kind of thinking but couldn't get their head around um, our response to homelessness in Canada and we know it's the same in the US or it was at that time um, was really focused on um, putting the pouring the resources into that expensive crisis intervention so those first responders those emergency shelters and little left over for prevention and sustained exits so you had the growth of an oversized role for that crisis response, which ultimately meant waiting until individuals were so deep into homelessness that a lot of harm had been done. And this was especially true for young people because as you know, they, they have their in youth development is very different from, from adults. They're still working through identity, uh, brain formation, um, all of those sorts of things. But in the second part of the diagram, you can see we, we were starting to imagine a different future where crisis interventions would still play a critical role. So that's really important to remember, but that the resources would be re redirected towards prevention and sustained exits, including things like permanent housing, and we know all of this, connection to community, natural supports, and those, those, those others, um, the, the other elements of like ability to thrive and plan for the future and, and have a good life. That's good. Oh, one other thing I'll mention about that: the over reliance on the on the crisis intervention often meant that we were also relying or focusing on the homelessness serving sector to solve all the problems that came out of the the larger systems, and it was the least resourced um, system that was largely charitable organizations. So that was also a tremendous imbalance, and and um, this will be dealt with later as well in the in the presentation. So sorry. next slide, please. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, so for years we, we, knew, um, we knew that we, we recognized a need. We knew of great work that was being conducted in isolation across the country. That was absolutely true. There was amazing things happening, and we knew where in places where youth were prevented from entering into homelessness, but we also knew that we were missing many more, and it was next to impossible to identify best practices, let alone scale them to other communities. So uh, another uh, aspect of this around the pathways model, um, youth were getting lost in the uptake of housing first in, housing first in Canada. So path, the pathways model was, uh, was showing great results, but it wasn't for young people. I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, and we were hopeful that we could actually help design a model that could work for youth, but we lacked the evidence to show that that model, what, what it would look like and, what, and what, which, for which youth and in what context. Um, there were some actions taken. Uh, we had uh, a couple of programs that really started to, to, to identify 
uh, local innovation across the country. We tested it, prototyped and tested out planning for youth homelessness planning across the country. We had some really, uh, really amazing funder though, and I have to to give a shout out to the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, which was a unique kind of funder, systems funder, with who want they wanted to address the root causes of ho homelessness. They were super risk tolerant, experimental, collaborative, very generous, and they allowed us to fail forward in ways that we wouldn't have had been able to do and really make mistakes and learn from them and, and move forward from there. Um, we also formed the national, uh, the national learning community on youth homelessness was was formed as well, and that was a key driver in, in how practice drove this process. So practitioners were at the, at the head of it. Um, and between the, the National Learning Community on Youth Homelessness and the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, which is our now our research arm, and, and uh, you may be familiar with the Homeless Hub, we actually set up a preliminary research agenda to shed light on homelessness. And this hadn't been done before, and it really helped coalesce where we wanted to go and drive our there's some key reports there. I'll just mention the one, a safe and decent place to live towards a housing first for fra framework for youth. It was the first time that um, practitioners, researchers, and youth with lived experience uh, got together and, and took housing first and tried to and looked at it critically to decide what, what needed to happen to make it work for young people. I think that's it. Our indicator of change, um, really at this point, we had broad recognition uh, prior by 2015 that, that youth have unique needs and considerations that weren't being considered on the national stage and at the community program level. And then the final slide for me, uh, it's one more slide, thanks. Uh, I think that's it actually. Is it stuck? It's really funny. <laughs> I think that's me, that transitions to me. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say, oh, there we go. Okay, so youth homelessness is finally on the radar. But do we know what our current interventions work? I have no idea what I'm doing. So there we go. Okay, <laughs> that's it for me. I'm going to pass it off to Amanda, who's going to talk to you about uh, phase two. Yes, each phase gets its own meme. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully solidify what's going on. But yeah, so we enter 2015. And at that point, yes, as Mary Jane says, youth homelessness is on the radar. We're now trying to figure out what works for whom and what context, who needs to be at the table to actually get this work off the ground and, um, and to make a real impact. So in phase two, that's where we really start to think about bringing together research, policy, planning, and practice in meaningful ways. Um, and so this stage, if we look at our timeline here, spans from 2015 to 2017. In 2015, Away Home Canada is launched um, by the end of 2015 and is headed by our fearless leader, Melanie Redman, with the support of really key partners, as Mary Jane said, like uh, Stephen Gates from the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, the Learning Community, our funders table that's led by Catherine Donnelly Foundation. So things start to pick up. We say, okay, we have this platform. And by by the end of this phase, we also start to have the research component with making the shift demonstrations labs, which Orpa will talk about more in the third phase. But that really helps us to be able to actually build this evidence base around what is working and what's not, and how do we improve the way that we work with youth to see outcomes improve. And so let's take a look at some of the challenges that came out in this phase. So first of all, um, we've got in our uh, youth voice and equity, really like as Mary Jane mentioned, we didn't really have right space models of intervention that were evidence-based to support young people. And while we knew that there was an overrepresentation of black indigenous and young people of color and to us, to us being uh, two spirited, which is a, a gender expression term for uh, indigenous uh, queer youth um, and LGBTQIA plus youth, we knew that they were overrepresented in our youth homelessness population populations, but we didn't have any real like tailored responses or there may be bits and pieces here and there. And similarly with um, our trust in relationships, there was a bit of territoriality, to be honest, uh, we had, that we had to navigate where everybody was doing their own piece and that they were working away in their own communities or their own organizations. But really, we weren't really collaborating in meaningful ways and we needed to find a way to get everybody at the table. And when we look at research to practice, we also lacked evidence, as I said, on best practices within the sector. And it was hard to bring people to the table to say like, we all have a role to play when we didn't have the solid evidence to say, 
who is implicated in this work. Um, and similarly, the innovation and knowledge that was being generated that was happening already was staying so close to the ground. It may have even been at a very individual program level within a team, but to be able to raise that up was the challenge at that point because it, it, we weren't really being able to like lift out and elevate those uh, key innovations. And finally, in our engaging policy and systems and prevention, there was generally a lack of understanding about what youth homelessness prevention was and what it wasn't and how to actually do it. So, like I said, we have this platform with Way Home Canada, which is great. And now we need to figure out how do we get people to the table? So in this phase, what really made the difference was shortly after Way Home Canada launched, we released with the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, the Without a Home Survey Report, which surveyed over a thousand youth across Canada about what their experience was. And what this showed was like the evidence really spoke for itself in saying that our systems and sectors across the board were failing. There's no individual person or organization or system that we could blame solely for this, that we were all implicated in the need to do better for young people. And so we have this platform with the Way Home Canada now to say, so, okay, we know that things are going badly, um, but we can mobilize around this. We can find solutions, we can elevate them, and Away Home Canada can provide the systems leadership to really use a collective impact model that brings all these folks to the table. And with Away Home as the backbone, being the facilitator or the convener or linking and leveraging what's already going on in Canada. Like we're a really small team. And when we started back then, it was uh, three people, four when I joined in 2016, and now we're only up to eight people. So there's a lot of impact from a small team because we're leveraging the work that's already happening on the ground. It's not just us, it's everyone together. So when we also um, started up this work, something that really incredible happened that we didn't anticipate, which was the um, federal government said they were going to start a, a process to develop a national housing strategy. The federal government had not been involved in housing policy for over 40 years at that point. So this was a key moment for us to be able to say, let's get youth and let's get prevention on the map. So we worked with the, learning, the National Learning Community on Youth Homelessness, developed some recommendations that we put forward to the federal government and also had key representation like uh, Dr. Stephen Gates was on the expert panel around the homelessness strategy and we had some representation of folks from the youth sector on that panel as well that were able to say yes we need to invest in addressing homelessness but we also need to think about how does prevention fit into this and that paid off we ended up actually seeing youth and prevention within the national housing strategy within the homelessness strategy reaching home and so um and at this point as well, things really start coalescing when we kick off uh, making the shift demonstration uh, lab, which allowed us to be able to start to test and gather evidence on effective prevention and early intervention models for young people, including Housing First for Youth, Youth Reconnect, and Family and Natural Supports. And so while we be begin this work at this stage, or was going to dig into what really starts happening in 2018 beyond, um, but what really is happening here all throughout this stage is that we're starting to make really meaningful connections between research and practice and influencing policy. All of them are starting to come together um, and it only gets, the momentum only builds and things only keep uh, like basically snowballing from there. Uh, and a lot of key reports and things come out at this phase as well, including that this is Housing First for Youth, the program model guide, which starts to flesh out what exactly is Housing First, what isn't it? Um, so, Basically, our indicators of change at this point, how we know that some things are changing is that there's generally broader openness to talking about the things that are not working for young people and also for folks in the sector, um, how this work can be really challenging when we're focused on crisis intervention all the time. And so not only are we able to talk about it, but we're actually interested in working together to find better solutions and better ways forward to be able to not only not not fear what the future could look like, but to see ourselves in the future, what would our roles look like if we were actually focused on prevention? Um, and at this stage as well, we start to see governments really turning to a way home for as a trusted resource on youth and on prevention as a way to tap into what's going on in the youth sector, what are young people saying? And also, as Mary Jane mentioned, there's uh, international uptake. Um, within six months of Away Home launching, Away Home America launched. And while we don't have like, they're, they're not chapters in the sense that we have any kind of say over what folks do, but it's really that they're signing on to this idea of we need to shift to prevention. We need to have a dedicated focus on youth. And so this starts to take off around the world in ways that we couldn't have imagined that it would. So now I'll pass it on to Orpa. Thanks, Amanda. Um, 
So like Amanda said, in this next phase where we're setting the prevention research agenda, everything really starts to converge as the movement around youth homelessness and youth homelessness prevention continues to grow. So if we go to the next slide, it's this phase is really about social, social research and design and setting our national research agenda. And so much happened in this phase because a lot of things were coming together as a result of us working through some of the previous challenges that Mary Jane and Amanda mentioned over the last two decades or two decades, two phases. <laughs> Luckily it's not been that long. But um, at this point, at the beginning of phase three, uh, youth homelessness had a growing platform because of the coalition building work that we had done in um, connecting communities with each other and, you know, encouraging open dialogue about what was working and what wasn't. Um, so youth homelessness was on the table or on the radar. Um, we had investment from the federal government, like Amanda mentioned, and Away Home, COH, um, and along with our partners, we were considered trusted resources on youth homelessness. And um, we were focusing on youth homeless, homelessness prevention. Mm -hmm. At this point, too, the sector was really recognizing the importance of research with more and more survey reports coming out, toolkits, and program model guides like Amanda mentioned previously. And uh, last but not least, prevention was really a buzzword at this point. Which brings us to our meme for this phase. Um, so people are really talking about prevention. We're really bought into this idea of youth homelessness prevention and recognize the need of um, for us to shift resources just from crisis interventions towards prevention and sustained exits. But there needed to be further clarification on what was considered prevention, what was not, and really what a systems approach to youth homelessness prevention that involved people and systems beyond just the youth homelessness sector could look like. And so we did a lot of, in this phase, definition work around what prevention is and what is not. And so you're not like Vicini here, confused about what prevention means. I'll just go into some of that um, definition here. Uh, so when we talk about youth homelessness prevention, we're referring to policies, practices, and interventions that are either, that either one, reduce the likelihood that a young person will experience homelessness, or two, will provide youth experiencing homelessness with the necessary supports to avoid re-entry into homelessness. So to bring this definition to life a little bit. For example, um, there are valuable programs that are focused on life skills building. So, you know, working with young people to learn how to do laundry or to cook. Um, and those programs in and of themselves um, don't prevent a young person from becoming homeless or from re-entering homeless. But programs that do things like support a young person to repair their relationship with their parents so that they can stay living at home, those kinds of programs do prevent a youth from becoming homeless or from re-entering homelessness. So hopefully that helps to do a little bit of the def definition, definition work that was happening during this phase. People were um, starting to recognize where their uh, programs and organizations fit into this prevention continuum. So if we go into the next slide, um, so like I was saying, prevention was on the map, but we were still experiencing some challenges in these areas of change and growth. And um, before I go into what some of these key challenges were, I'd really like to um, just turn to my colleague Heidi, who is also a panelist on this webinar, just to talk a little bit about um, Heidi's experience when she was working at the Boys and Girls Club of Calgary. At that time, they were leading um, some of the thinking around youth homelessness prevention, um, which evolved a lot with, with the Boys and Girls Club's relationship with Away Home and with COH. And so Heidi, did you wanna, if you could give a little bit of perspective on what it was like at that time when prevention was a buzzword and um, how that sort of changed over this phase three time period, that would be awesome. I can do that. Um, so yeah, so I guess um, like many of you, so we're in the thick of it um, as service providers really navigating ourselves through what Housing First is, um, Housing First for Youth is, and really starting to gain um, a better understanding that these are the most vulnerable youth um, and they're the most extreme high-risk youth, right? So we're starting to use language like vulnerability and risk. Um, but as we're sitting there in our programs and as we're sitting there in our staff meetings um, and walking through those crises with young people, we started having conversations about 
it would be amazing if we could just turn the clock back a few years. What difference would five years um, make if we went back five years with these young people and their families? And what would that look like, right? Um, and so th that was difficult. That was really difficult for us because um, for all of you folks that are involved in the work, you know that there's um, very little time uh, to be able to set aside, to think about how to do things differently um, because of the pace of our work. And so, like Orpa said, prevention started to become this new buzzword. And that started to take on a life of in itself within Canada with all the different sectors. Um, going back to Amanda's original point, organizations didn't share well. They didn't play nicely in the sandbox with each other. We didn't share information. Um, and everybody had their own idea of what prevention was going to be or what it should be. And so now all of a sudden we were sitting in a world where these people thought prevention looks like this. We thought prevention looks like this. Um, and I think one of the things that we saw happen was organizations created space um, which was so valuable, I think that we took it for granted at that moment, but created space um, to start thinking about what prevention actually was and what would it look like and what would our work look like if we started to support young people outside of a housing first for youth model. So outside of the most vulnerable, um, the most extreme high risk young people, what would it look like for those um, young people? I think it was during probably that time, um, not super great with dates because we were in the thick of it. But I think it was at that time that we realized that whatever prevention was was going to be that this was probably going to be a key indicator for ending youth homelessness. Thanks for that perspective, Heidi. And Heidi's role um, with Open Home has changed as well. And I'll get into the making the shift demonstration lab a little bit more as we talk about some of these areas of change and growth. But um, one of the one of the key things that we were still missing was this direct um, youth voice about what which where systems and programs are failing and what would have prevented their experiences of homelessness and we needed that youth voice to help inform and guide our research along with all of the other um, research that we were doing in terms of mm -hmm. trust and relationships this trust and relationships and research to practice these areas of change and growth were re have been really really impacted at this point by the launch of the making the shift demonstration lab so as amanda mentioned previously the making the shift demonstration lab um, is a, a, a demonstration lab that's basically building evidence around these youth homelessness prevention interventions so housing first for youth youth reconnect and family natural supports and in doing that work um, we really had to figure out how to work better collaborate collaboratively with research and how to mobilize um, research quickly so that it could impact practice and so while the the lab is launching we're also growing as a network so in terms of trust and relationships we're trying to manage the growth of the network as away homes work was being taken up across communities and internationally and we're continuing to build this evidence base through the making the shift demonstration lab and we also needed to work to maintain trust and relationships with existing partners so um, Heidi's role with away home and with the making the shift demonstration lab has was key and has been key um, in connecting communities with one another, as well as connecting them into what was happening with youth homelessness and youth homelessness prevention across Canada. And that that was key during this um, during this phase in addressing some of these challenges around trust and relationships. Um, with research to practice as well, the sector, as I said, um, was really recognizing the importance of research, but it was challenging to bridge the different cultures and, and just the general difference, differences between researchers and practitioners. So we learned a lot and we're continuing to learn about the the collaboration that um, is required to quickly mobilize that research. And Heidi's role is with the Making the Shift Demonstration Lab is super important here as well. And I do wanna preface, um, because we we're talking a lot about the Making the Shift Demonstration Lab in this phase and the work that went into continuing to build trust with these communities that were um, helping to build an evidence base around prevention interventions, but we'll really, really get into um, what that work looks like and and get Heidi's perspective on that work in the next uh, webinar and in the webinar after that. So 
if that's really piquing your interest, don't worry, we'll really, really dig into it in the next two webinars. Um, but there was a lot going on with the Making the Shift demonstration lab at, at, during this phase as well. And lastly, with um, in terms of engaging policies and systems in prevention, there was still a lack of understanding around so we were clarifying and doing definition work around what is and is not prevention and people were starting to figure out where their programs and um, and communities fit in, but there was still a lack of understanding about who and which systems are responsible for what in the continuum of youth homelessness prevention. So those were some of the challenges that we were grappling with at this stage. And so a lot happened here, but um, as a general overview um, in addressing and working through some of the challenges that I previously mentioned, what started to happen was young people through um, the what would it take report were able to provide direct input on what could have prevented their experiences of homelessness. And that report um, and critical youth voice helped guide and inform the research agenda for the roadmap for the prevention of youth homelessness, which I'll um, show you shortly as well. Um, and it also helped inform the research agenda of the Making the Shift demonstration lab. And so we're starting to get with the launch of Making the Shift with uh, what would it take and with these other key reports that are coming out at this phase, we're starting to get a critical mass of content around youth homelessness, which is all very much focused on youth homelessness prevention. And this critical mass of content and research broadens the scope of who needs to be involved in youth homelessness prevention. So um, we're starting to talk about uh, what roles different systems play and how they can be part of this youth homelessness prevention continuum, which will lead us into the phase that Amanda is going to talk about around um, efforts to scale prevention and how we scale through knowledge mobilization. So in the next slide here, we just have a little visual of the critical mass of content that we had been building towards and the burst of reports that were released over 2016 and 2018. Um, but one of the key reports that was released and was really critical in helping um, the sector and beyond understand what the continuum of prevention could look like is the roadmap for the prevention of youth homelessness. And so we can, uh, we'll share many links after this webinar, but we can share out the link for this report as well. But this report really for folks um, clarifies what prevention is, what it isn't, as I said, doing that um, essential definition work. And it also clarifies what a systems approach to prevention could look like. So what roles systems and organizations can play within youth homelessness prevention. And, um, Last but not least, it provides examples of interventions and evidence for prevention. So people could really see themselves and plug themselves into this roadmap um, of, for the prevention of youth homelessness. And so during this phase, really, the, the indicators of change were that prevention was starting to become common language, not just amongst the youth homelessness sector, but um, with policymakers as well, with researchers, with anyone who's interested in youth homelessness. And we're starting to reach a critical mass of content and resources through the Making the Shift Demonstration Lab, through the What Would It Take report, the Roadmap for the Prevention of Youth Homelessness, and all of these other resources that are, are being released. And I'll just turn it back to Amanda for the last exciting phase that we're gonna discuss. <laughs> Yeah, so we've reached our final meme of our series here. Um, so we know what prevention is and who's involved. And it turns out it's all of us. So it's time to stop pointing the fingers and figure out how we're going to work together. So we've got our Spider-Mans here all pointing their fingers, but they're all the same person. We're all involved in solving youth homelessness. So now we've really got to get serious about if we know what the problem is, we know some ideas about solutions to prevention, let's figure out how we're going to scale this work and hold each other accountable to actually making this happen. So this phase is really where um, efforts are starting to take off. We have a critical mass of resources that are coming together. We also at this phase, if I go to the next slide, we um, it, in 2018 and 2019, we were really building towards getting Making the Shift Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab, which is um, a very complex thing to describe. But basically what it is, is this like vehicle for research that is very focused on youth homelessness prevention. So 
Um, it's a federally funded um, body, like its own entity that allows us to have a full national research agenda on youth homelessness prevention right across the continuum from early intervention to sustaining exits, specific thoughts around um, interventions for Indigenous youth, racialized youth, queer youth, all of it, all kind of coalescing together um, to be able to like coordinate our efforts in research across Canada to be able to mobilize what's going to happen, what we need to have happen in terms of solutions and prevention. So in 2020, this is really where things start to pick up with this. And so by the beginning of last year, we had a really like a clear picture of what needed to be done. We have making the shift uh, uh, ink the um, and so now the, what the real work is, is actually enacting and sustaining change, which is probably the more challenging work. We've done all the thinking, we've done a lot of um, like co coordinating and collaborating. So now we need to do the work. So there are, that coming back to our kind of areas of change and growth, um, what really, really, I think um, it, it has always been a part of the conversation, but with COVID-19 and particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement resurging over uh, the summer of last year, as well as some land back uh, movements in Canada and in the United States as well, equity was really at the center and was centered in all of the conversations. And we realized that there is like, a realized while well, we know that there is a need to be actively anti-racist and actively anti and decolonial in our work and, and sector wide, as well as working with other sectors and systems. Cause we know that youth homelessness is rooted in colonialism is rooted in white supremacy. So how are we actually grappling with those things constantly through all of our work? The other piece around trust and relationships is that COVID-19 really demonstrated that we need to be working together. Um, when everything got disrupted, uh, communities were turning to one another, some unique partnerships between public systems or even the private sector or civil society started to happen. People were trying to uh, work really quickly to make sure that some of the gaps that were created by uh, services shutting down were filled. Um, and then in the stage as well, in the research to practice, we start seeing um, that we need to have more than just short term um, research and we've known this. So how do we actually get sustainable funding for longitudinal research that shows not only that interventions work at the six month or one year point after intervention, but what's going on maybe two, three, five years down the road? How do we know that young people continue to be supported and continue to thrive out after we work with them and beyond? Um, and then we also are still figuring out this lag time between research and impact on practice. That's an ongoing conversation and we're getting better at it, but it is something, it's a learning. And I think something to mention in this phase, like it is something that's still ongoing. Um, we're right in the midst of this phase. And I don't want to give the impression that we are somehow like this socialist utopia that has youth homelessness figured out because we've gone through all this. We've got a lot of work to do still. And particularly when it comes to scaling the work that we've um, and the research that we've done. And finally, in terms of engaging policy and systems, I think something that also is not new is that we need to break down the silos between government and departments um, and really pursuing systems justice. How do we hold the various systems and policymakers and sectors accountable for their roles in preventing and ending youth homelessness? So in terms of COVID-19, I'll just go through this at a high level, but basically we really immediately realized that the sector was getting hit hard by the pandemic and needed to mobilize and to find ways to support the sector. Since we have this national platform, we were able to quickly pull together resources, um, uh, Orpa and Heidi have been leading the charge on a community of practice that had been meeting weekly, and I think he's still bi-weekly potentially. Yeah, bi-weekly. And so this group of uh, folks actually, it ended up uh, taking off in ways that we couldn't have imagined before the pandemic, where now we have uh, this community of practice that wants to continue to engage with people that were outside of our immediate network. They maybe were on the periphery following along through newsletters or um, just following our research in general. And um, the other big piece here is that uh, we were able to help advocate on behalf of and with the sector to be able to identify early on what were some immediate critical needs. So things like moratoria on exits from care. Young people were at risk of exiting uh, child protection with no support and in the midst of a pandemic. And that just wasn't going to fly. So we worked with our national partners um, in uh, child protective services and child welfare to be able to advocate to provinces to say, we need to put a stop to this. We need to continue to provide support to young people and in fact beyond the pandemic we need to have a conversation about what it looks like to support young people so the next thing here um, 
just to kind of summarize this whole phase that we're in and working through is that this kind of coalescence of uh, COVID-19, the International Black Lives Matter movement, Indigenous land back movements, it's all illuminating how we can't go back to normal because normal was never centered on young people. It was never rights-based. It was never equitable. And that prevention and working across systems and sectors is the way that we need to go. And so um, through this phase also, uh, last year we were uh, celebrating Away Home Canada's fifth anniversary. Um, and you're welcome to read our report, which gives a nice little summary of everything we've been doing this last number of years. Um, but also we started to fund the research through that Making the Shift Inc. Um, and getting research projects, both COVID-19 specific and beyond moving. And and with that comes uh, a lot of a lot more investment in things like training and technical assistance to support community organizations, um, as well as frontline practitioners and policymakers, everybody kind of across the spectrum of working on youth homelessness to be able to increase their capacity to do prevention work. And so some of what that looks like, and even though this slide says for the frontline, it, there's resources and things being developed for people beyond frontline practice, but that includes things like training, so developing specific trainings on program models, whether it's Housing First for Youth, Family Natural Supports, Youth Reconnect, um, things like case consultation, so kind of like coaching and Heidi's amazing role of working with communities one-on-one -on -one to figure out like what, uh, what they need and how they can be supported and peer knowledge exchange through things like communities of practice. And then finally, the thing that we've been doing all the way along and with our friends at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, making tools, guides and reports um, and mobilizing that knowledge beyond the sector. Um, so the kind of like key indicators of change here, and again, this is still evolving, this is still happening, is that equity and youth voice and rights-based approaches aren't just nice to haves in our research and our policy and planning and practice, but they're essential and that we really need to have this at the, uh, as a focus and that this conversation is still ongoing. It hasn't just dropped since uh, um, 2020. And we're now we're really focused on what does it look like to build sustainability, fidelity and accountability to our models and to actually make prevention a reality. So that takes us to the end of our four phases. <laughs> and so it's a lot of information to throw at you, but I think now we can turn it over to questions and maybe Carrie, you can help guide us through that because we've got lots of time. Yeah, sure. So we actually have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat here from Jacqueline White from Close Knit. She's asking, what would you say the major findings of your research have been? Um, also, I love the working with vulnerable youth to enhance their natural supports report, which I'm understanding is not an official making the shift report. What research findings are you building on, i.e. natural supports? Who wants to take that one? I know, I'm wondering. I think, I think Heidi could probably take the latter uh -huh. one, right? But um, I'm not sure about the vulnerable youth. Well, through, we can talk a little bit about the, um, so with making the shift where we have seven sites um, out of Alberta and one site out of Toronto that are running family natural supports programs. And so we're building an evidence through those sites, building evidence through those sites around what family natural supports work looks like and, um, you know, what what lessons there are to learn from these programs. And through that work, we've developed um, not only a family natural supports training, but the, the framework for family natural supports was recently released as well. So those are all resources, um, Jacqueline, that you can look at. But um, in terms of learnings, Heidi, maybe there are some high level, we talk a lot with the sites about what they're learning on the ground, but um, maybe Heidi, there are some things that are top of mind that you can discuss that are coming out, especially with COVID-19 and the pandemic around the family and natural support sites that we can just let Jacqueline know about. Jacqueline, it is so great to see, I can't see you, but it is so great to know that you're here. Um, that makes me a little bit excited. Um, great question. So we've had lots of learnings and our learnings continue to change. Um, that report, you are correct. Um, it, 
was not making the shift away home was not um, really a part of that. That more came, that document came out of Alberta that was funded with multiple communities um, across Alberta that were starting to engage kind of during that um, time that Orpa spoke about what, what is prevention? What does that look like? And how do we do that? Um, I think that um just looking at your question to make sure that I answer all of the pieces. I think, I don't know if I can speak offhand, um, off the top of my head, about what the key research pieces have been. I know that for sure, one of the things that we know is that, um, very similar to Housing First for Youth, family and actual supports cannot, um, should not, I shouldn't say cannot, should not have any time limits on that program as well, just because of the um, intricacies um, of those relationships and that how much time they do take to build. So we are seeing that it's, it's um, very difficult to determine what that's going to look like and what the work is going to look like because it's so much, it's so incredibly individualized. Um, Orpa had mentioned that we created a family natural supports training. So our family natural supports training was also built off of um, part of that document that was created in Alberta with support from the United Way here. Um, and then also it was built with community sharing with us um, many pieces over several years, actually, where they had told us you know what, we get the philosophy, we get the framework, but now you need to help us take it into practice. Mm -hmm. And so we have a training now that really is geared towards, I would say, frontline staff, um, but it's also very geared towards leadership and senior leadership to help understand how there needs to be um, some change management involved in organizations, because for a very long time in Alberta, and I can, I don't, want to speak farther um, than that but families were seen as the enemy families were seen as evil and so there was a a major shift that needed to take place with even um, agencies and staff understanding that families were actually the expert so we went from a complete swing on the pendulum to say they're not actually evil in matter of fact, we have to listen to them harder and we have to listen to them longer because they're the ones that actually have all the answers. And we're just going to walk alongside them um, and insert supports and then get out of the way when they don't need us and let them practice those tools. Um, and then I think one of the other big pieces that we've learned while sharing um family natural supports and what that is throughout community is we've become very clear that it can be a program but it's also a philosophy in the way that we work so family natural supports the philosophy and the guiding principles are very much intertwined and should be intertwined in any type of housing first for youth program. Um, it should be intertwined. The philosophy should be intertwined in every shelter that we um, intake young people at, at night. Um, for example, when a young person walks into that shelter, we should be asking, where did you just come from? Where are your family? We should be looking at um, those indicators and looking for those people the minute that we start engaging young people. I think the other biggest thing that we've learned is that, I'm gonna use the word client, even though I don't like the word client, but that the client has changed and that um, we've become accustomed to saying that we support young people. Um, we now support young people and their families and anybody else that the young people designates as their people. And so for every one young person, every client that um, you support, there's probably could be, you know, five to 15 people behind that person that you're now having conversations with, that you're now engaging um, and that you're now realizing is a part of the solution to make this a healthier situation for that young person and all of their people, siblings, aunties, whatever that looks like. So I think that has been um, one of our big learnings and one of those aha moments that people were like, wow, that that does take me a second to wrap my head around that the client, so to speak, has changed. 
Heidi and Orpa, I have a, another sort of additional uh, question for this. It's a little bit off the research findings, but I'm really interested, and I know you've spoken to us a lot about this, around that whole shift that had to happen and maybe two or three learnings are when you brought together researchers with practitioners in this formal way and and some of the things that happened around there. Could you could you just talk a little bit about that? I think that's really interesting and it might be interesting for participants to hear. Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, well, the change. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's no nice way to say this. And also, I will just say it bluntly. But we got to a place um, in our community anyways, within the youth sector, where I like to refer it to as now we all had to agree to leave our egos at the door. Because um, that was probably one of the most key ingredients in order for us to move forward. So if we all had a similar agenda, which was at that time to end youth homelessness, to prevent youth homelessness, whatever your language um, and your mission statement is, we needed to do that with vulnerability and no egos being allowed at the table where everybody mm. was able to... Um, share their experience, share their expertise, um, and also realize that they had a voice. And I think one of the big change management pieces that ORPA also really talked about was um, we left young people out for a really long time, like a really long time. And they were actually the experts. And when we first, when we finally realized that and got out of our own ways um, and went to young people, they actually had it all figured out. They would have gotten... Um, us to where we needed to go a lot faster if we would have um, engaged them a lot sooner. It has been mind blowing what young people have had to say and where we had conversations. I'm just going to give this as an example. Like a year ago, young people had already actually figured that out, but we just mm -hmm. gave them space to um, talk about it. And so I think that was also um, one of the big pieces Honesty. Honesty was also a really big piece about change management um, and what we saw needed to happen within organizations and in the sector, right? Um, we needed to share our bad days, which we've been trained to not. We write funding reports only sharing good stories um, and sharing really good data. But this time it took for us to talk about where we couldn't actually move forward, um, where our pain points were and where we were hitting walls to be able to um, move forward and take everybody, uh, go with everybody, I guess, on that journey, which really spoke to the trust, I guess, that that phase that Orpa and Amanda spoke to, that trust um, and building relationships phase, because once we did all of that, it was, it was really quite easy, and I use that word loosely because that took years, but it was really easy to be able to have those hard conversations and know that it was in, in a place that you could have those hard conversations and that wasn't going to come back to bite you. To add to that as well, Heidi, I think with um, research to practice and this um, challenge we're talking about in terms of, you know, bringing research and practice together so that what's coming out of research can quickly impact practice. One of the things that has helped a lot with that mm -hmm. is the community of practice spaces that we've cultivated through the Making the Shift Demonstration Lab and also post COVID-19 or throughout COVID-19 um, with people really looking to connect to each other and learn about what's going on across communities and also what getting like distilled information about what's coming out of research and how that can impact what they're doing. And mm -hmm. Heidi's, um, which we'll talk about in the next webinar more, but mm. Heidi's key role here is really unique and important in that she kind of is helping to translate some of what's happening with research to practitioners. And um, yeah, that's been a really huge piece for, for change management, I think too. Mm -hmm. And there was those um, cultural differences too between, uh, you know, when researchers and practitioners, like how did the transfer of knowledge as you're talking about is really like the cultural differences between like, for example, mm -hmm. researchers are, are can, you know, in a world where they're, you hold on to the, the knowledge until it's really validated. But this process needed iterative 
responses. So practitioners needed to know what was happening, what they're finding out from the different uh, research methodologies to understand what, how they could on the go make changes as opposed to waiting for you know, a year or two down the road to get that. So I, I found that really fascinating and listening to both of you talk about it. I don't know if you have anything else to, to add to that about how the change management that happened between actual researchers and, and the practitioners in the sites. Hmm. I think I think it kind of went through a similar process, but it didn't take so, um, such a long time. I think that we invested in each other to understand mm. where we came from, right? So where I come from in my work, I'm extremely risk, like, let's take the risk, right? I have two <laughs> rules at the bottom of the day, keep kids safe and don't light things on fire. Everything <laughs> else, like, right, as long as kids are safe, like, we should go and, and push the boundary and see what happens, don't maybe tell people that um, there's like <laughs> less attendees on the uh, webinar now. So that's great. Cause like <laughs> everybody didn't hear that. Um, but keeping kids safe, like that's our bottom line. Right. But everything else, I think that we can figure out. And so when you go into uh, your research team who like Mary Jane said, where they're like, uh, we actually need to double check that actually what I meant by that was we need to check it over 20 times and then we need to make sure that everybody agrees with that. Um, I needed to understand where they were coming from and I needed to understand and respect their processes. Um, and I think once I did that and also was able to speak their language because it was really important for me to speak the researcher's language to then inform the frontline um, and the service providers what was needed. So as long as they knew that I was gonna do it my own way, but get what they needed done, um, we were okay, but it, it took investment. It took investment for me to say, I don't understand that. Um, I need you to spend more time with me to help me um, learn that process. And then once we had that figured out, it was incredible, the mountains that we moved. Um, we also have research to practice meetings that happen every month. And those are also key um, for us to stay connected. So they get data, they get numbers, um, they're following charts, and I have the stories. Um, and ORPA has um, stories from our community of practice calls. And so we put all of those together to really form what the work looks like um, through narratives and through data. So that's been pretty neat. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I saw Jacqueline had um, yeah. another question here. Jacqueline, like that is a loaded question mm -hmm. um, that <laughs> I'm going to give my best shot. Uh, and it's not going to be straightforward. I promise you that. So I actually don't disagree with cash transfers. I think that depending on where that young person is at, I think that um, I think that there's a level of independence that comes along with that. I also think that as an organization, you're showing trust. Um, you're giving a bit of autonomy. I think it's just being like a parent, right? Here's five dollars. Go to the store. Um, and can you pick up some milk and you can also get yourself whatever, whatever, right? There's like some lessons, there's some life lessons that can be learned there with that cash transfer. Um, I've done cash transfers where we have given young people all of their money for their rent. Um, and we've given them, them their money for, I don't want to call like, like, you know, their groceries or, or what have you, whatever your program, um, like supplements and pays for while they're with you we've done that but I've also um had really clear conversations with young people to say this isn't this isn't um a gimme right if this goes sideways um if your rent doesn't get paid um so on and so forth that we will have to do it a different way um I have never I, I would have to think about it, but I don't think that we've ever started young people on cash transfers. I think that that's something that as we get to know the young person that we do that. Um, 
And then the other piece is, is that there was a whole, like, as far as uh, system change internally, there was a whole other piece that we had to work through with our finance department because of auditing purposes. How were we trans, how are we tracking EMTs? How did we determine where, um, like, if that money was actually going for rent because funders were telling us that should we get audited, we needed to know that, um, you know, actual landlords got paid, food actually got paid, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a bigger conversation that I would always be um, happy to have with you or anybody that wanted to have it. Um, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with cash transfers. I think that you're teaching them something. Um, you're teaching them a real life skill and you're teaching them a way of the world and how it actually shows up right now and giving them opportunities to either succeed um, or fail safely. And I think there's also an interesting dynamic that we're still like, that's still developing and we're still trying to unpack with COVID-19 and the federal government providing uh, in Canada, providing $2,000 a month um, uh, Canada emergency response benefits. And now it's uh, changed um, to recovery benefits, but um, some youth were accessing those benefits, but with there's an, an interesting dynamic here where with reduced maybe connection to services directly, less interaction with uh, the people that they'd be getting support from. Um, and just with general confusion around the actual benefit itself, it, in some cases, the access to that benefit backfired and we're seeing not just for young people, but for vulnerable people across the board um, that applied and got the benefit and are now being told that they owe money back to the government. Um, so we're trying to now navigate, how do we make sure that young people are not on the hook for that money um, and oh. when they're already in a vulnerable, vulnerable situation and just kind of going, you know what, that money's gone. Like, let's, <laughs> let's figure out how to do this better, but mm. lesson learned, right? So, yeah. Oh, that's okay. So that's an interesting question. Case management wasn't optional. Um, yeah, again, that's not black and white for me. I think that case management changes over time. And I think that as the young person is getting closer to graduation or discharge, whatever that word is that you use, I think that it's not as intensive as it was on day one. Um, I think, I think that um, there were times, there are times when we have made the decision with the young person because we don't want them um, to be derailed or try to figure out what's going on. But I think that there have been times where we've disengaged, but disengaged intentionally. So the young person knows that we're disengaging and, and they know what that's going to look like, because I think that that is a, from the focus groups that we've had from the young person that have shared um, their experiences with us is that if we give them the same level of support that we did on day one, that we do on the last day, we actually have created too much of a ledge for them to drop off of. And it's too scary. So what we had, what we did start doing is we like pretended that there was phases. There wasn't phases, but it was an easy way um, to explain that to young people is that we knew that they were getting close to graduation. We would go through all of the things um, that they had completed, all of the um, areas that they had succeeded in, all of the areas that they didn't need our support in anymore. And then we would ask them the question, what is it that you think that you need now from us? When we had that conversation, because it was intentional, young people started to say, I don't actually know if I do need you. So what we would do then is we would make a plan for graduation and it might've been two or three months down the road. Um, and so that young person, we would not do home visits as often, maybe once a month. Um, they would like all of those, those cash pieces would be um, independent. Um, but we were still there acting as their safety net. So just in case something went on, they were still um, involved in the program and they still could call us. And then really what happens like, but so we weren't like 
we weren't goal setting every 30 days. Um, we weren't, um, we weren't doing those pieces. Like we weren't doing the case notes every day because we weren't talking to that young person, but there was an agreement in place with them that they knew that this was going to happen. Um, but it, yeah, I think the key part, we screwed up. Um, and I don't have any problems telling you that we screwed up a couple of times where we forgot to tell the young person that we were going to disengage. And that was a hard lesson that we learned um, because kids thought that we were, rejecting them um and so we fixed that really quickly and made sure never ever to make a young person feel like that again um but i would say no case management is not optional in the beginning stages um and we have lots of like well we have tools um making the shift in a way home created tools indicators um, that don't have to be black and white because our work isn't black and white. But what are we looking for to know when it's the right time to have that conversation? So we don't expect teams who are new to this work or are trying to get closer to fidelity in this work to figure out what is it that we're looking for. We built those things in for a community to have so they kind of know when it's time to start those conversations. I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Well, it looks like that's all the questions. I want to thank everyone for your time today. Um, I want to thank our friends um, at Away Home Canada. Um, up next, as you'll see on the slide, session two, unpacking frontline prevention. Um, you can register for that webinar on the National Network for Youth website. We're also going to send you out some information following this webinar with the recording and some slides and other good stuff. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.